Good morning, everybody. Welcome back for this, uh, in this case, colloquium from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Juan Cortino, from, Cortina from CMAT here in Spain. And he will talk about the Cherenkov Telescope Array status and prospect. Dr. Uh, Juan Cortina will be introduced by our uh, IP of the Severo Ochoa project, uh, Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Rene. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for being here or in online again, uh, this uh, new uh, colloquium from the Severo Ochoa program. But first of all, thank you very much, Juan Cortina, for having accepted uh, our invitation. It's a pleasure for us to, to have you here. Uh, Juan Cortina um, is currently a researcher, uh, a research scientist at the CMAT, as René said, in Madrid. And uh, his, work, his work is devoted to the development of scientific instrumentation for the detection of very high energy gamma, ray, uh, gamma rays. So it means that uh, energy is higher than 20 uh, GeVs. Uh, using Cherenkov uh, telescopes, uh, being uh, their, uh, the, her, his scientific exploitation uh, mainly devoted to the study of galactic sources uh, as gamma ray binaries and supernova remnants. Uh, he graduated and earned a PhD in physics at the University, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and his uh, thesis was focused on the study of cosmic rays uh, with the Higgler detectors. He worked then as a postdoc, uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Physics in, in Munich uh, uh, until 2002, and then as a staff researcher at the uh, Instituto de Física de Altas Energías in, in Catalan, I don't know how to say it, in, Bar in Barcelona um, uh, until 2018. Uh, he has led uh, the International Magic Collaboration, and he currently co leads the LST a collaboration, which is in charge of building the 23 meter telescopes of the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Today, as you know, he's talking about the uh, the upda update of this project. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the, st the status and projects of the CTA, the T Cherenkov Telescope Array. Uh, welcome again, and the floor is yours. So thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel, for the introduction. It's, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So let me go right into the, the business of introducing the Cherenkov Telescope uh, Array, CTA. Okay. So uh, this is an outlook. I'll be describing how we detect uh, very high energy gamma rays. Uh, actually, there's been a seminar up here at this institute the other day about the, uh, so I guess many of you know already how this works, but let me introduce it quickly. Then the CTA, then the science we are doing with these kind of telescopes, and then how, and then about the status of the, of the project right now. So uh, yeah, eyes on the gamma ray sky. So how we detect gamma rays, uh, with Cherenkov telescopes. So as a, as a introduction for total newbies, uh, this is the electromagnetic spectrum from radio to gamma wave, to gamma rays. And I'll be talking about something to actually to the right of this slide, uh, very high energy gamma rays, okay? Um, so at, at, at the highest, uh, at so-called high energy gamma rays, uh, around uh, more than 30 or 20 mega electron volts, you can do this kind of detection from space with satellites, okay? Uh, satellites like Agile uh, or Fermilat, I'll be talking about Fermilat extensively, uh, with a rather wide field view, but unfortunately a very limited collection area. Um, to give you an idea, at uh, 30 GV, so at uh, the energies I'll be talking about, the, the Kraft Nebula, which is the brightest uh, steady object, um, will only, uh, these satellites will only collect around one gamma ray every three hours from it. So it's very hard to do science with this, with these photon rates. And you need, uh, so you need larger collection areas. 
And the, the only way to do that is from the crown. Okay. So typically very high energy gamma rays, uh, 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 this range is typically defined as, as the range where you detect gamma rays from the ground. Okay. And this starts around, as Isabel already said, uh, around 20 giga electron volts. Okay. So there are essentially two techniques here. Um, and they are both based on the, on the gamma ray producing a shower of particles in the atmosphere. A shower of particles that somehow makes it to the ground. So you can see the tail on the ground with particle detectors. So you can see electrons, uh, positrons, muons with particle detectors. Or you can see the light that these particles produce in the atmosphere when it reaches the ground with Cherenkov telescopes. And these are simply light collectors. So the standard telescopes say with very simple ones, with simple optics would you collect the light into a camera, okay? So when you deal with this particular race, what you have is, a, is an array of many particle detectors on the ground. This was the Higra array in La Palma a long time ago. And when you see this shower and you see that there's a distribution of, of particles in the ground and, you, uh, and there's a distribution of arrival times of these particles, and um, from the distribution of particle density, you can get you get an idea of the energy of the gamma ray. And from the distribution of arrival times, as you can imagine, when, if, if the particles come from this direction, they will arrive to these uh, detectors first, and then to these ones, and so on. And you get an idea with the arrival times of the direction of the gamma rays. Okay. So these kind of detectors, arrays of particle detectors, they have rather poor angular energy energy resolutions. They have kind of poor gamma hadron separation, but they have fantastic duty cycle. They can observe the sky for 100% of the time. They are not affected by moonlight, for instance, or by this or by satellite. And they have a large field of view. They typically cover a wide uh, field of view of more than one star radian. Okay, so this this is one of the techniques using particle detectors, and, and here this here it gets personal because this was my thesis back in 1997, and I used this array La Palma, which was like 200 times 200 meters, and we wanted to detect gamma rays. We didn't detect anyone. We failed completely to detect gamma ray sources, uh, and now at 20 years or so later, these Chinese have built this gigantic array called Lhasa in, in Tibet, which is like 20 times bigger and with a much uh, denser coverage and with uh, uh, water tanks that uh, provide additional information and with lots of muon detectors. And they have, of course, of course, <laughs> managed to detect gamma rays. And as you will see, it's been extremely successful. So this technique has been brought to maturity with this, with this array. You may also use, instead of these particle detectors here, all these guys here, uh, water tanks. They are act as particle detectors, like scintillator uh, detectors, but you, the particle simply uh, generates light inside this, this big water tank. Uh, and it works the same as last. So you can reconstruct the direction of the gamma ray or the, or the energy of the gamma ray. Okay, this is in this is Mexico, this is called Hawk. But I'll be talking about these Cherkov telescopes. Okay, so this is the other alternative technique to detect the uh, very high energy gamma rays from the ground. And here what you see is the Cherkov light, which is near UV blue light produced by these particles. The light covers a, a rather big pool of some 200 meters diameter. Okay, you place a, 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 te a telescope here, you, you collect the light, and you get a real image of this shower here. Okay, so you image the whole shower. You don't see just the tail of the shower, like the particle detectors. And that means that you have a much better angular and spectral resolution. You can actually use several telescopes to, to triangulate the direction of the gamma ray. You get much better angular resolution than with particular rays. And you get much better spectral resolution. The energy you can also reconstruct that. Okay. 
So uh, the collection area is actually this area because anywhere you place the telescope, you detect the gamma ray. And that means the collection area is in the order of 100,000 square meters. It's huge. Okay. We, only with these huge collection areas, you can detect gamma rays because they are so rare at these energies. Okay. Unfortunately, you have to operate only on dark nights. Okay. Not during the day, not during not when the moon is around. Um, so they have a duty cycle typically less than 15%. And unfortunately, the field of view is not so big. It's, it's rather like 50 R degrees. I mean, it's huge compared to an optical telescope, but it's, it's, it's only 10 to the minus three of the sky compared to particle detectors, it's, it's small, okay? So this is how they work. And there are several of these arrays. These are the, the, the ones that are running now. The HES array in Namibia, five telescopes. The MAGIC array in La Palma, two telescopes but very large ones. And the Veritas array in, in Arizona in the US, four of these 10 meter glass telescopes. This is 17 meter, okay. This has been running for a while. This is 2003, also 2003. So uh, for a while, and we are running out of targets. We are running out of, uh, our sensitivity is not good enough. So that's why we think that this is not enough. And we need to go for, for a new generation of, of detectors. We need to go to CTA, to the Cherenkov Telescope Array. The key to the whole business of the Cherenkov, how does it work, this CTA? So there are several key facts that are actually all summarized here, how CTA works. One is that by having three telescope size classes, so you have this large size telescope, these guys here, which are 23 meters. You have uh, medium sized telescopes, 12 meters, and uh, small size telescopes, SSDs, four meters. This is the ones that were covered in the in the seminar the other day, in this Astri, Astri Array seminar. Um, so we, we by having different uh, size of, of telescopes, you can cover a much wider range extending from 20 GB, 20 giga electron volts to more than, to more than uh, one tera electron volt, okay? By having many telescopes, you can you increase the sensitivity because you cover a much wider, you have a much wider collection area. By having two sites, one in the Northern hemisphere, another one in the Southern hemisphere, you can cover the full sky, okay? Um, and as, as I said, this is in the order of tens of telescopes. So you will beat the current arrays that are only four telescopes or so by far. Okay. So these are the key facts about the CTA. This is actually where the sites will be. So this was decided quite some time ago. Well, this, the headquarters will be in Italy. There will be a science data management center in, in Germany, in, in Berlin. And there will be the two sites, one in La Palma, Okay, well, you will have a smaller array of 0.8 kilometers on the side diameter. And in the, in the south, you will have one near Paranal, uh, much, much bigger one simply because you have many of these small telescopes. Okay, but for instance, the number of large telescopes, LSTs, will be the same in both sides. Okay, and the number of MSTs will be similar. Okay, so these are, will be the two sides that will cover the, two, the, whole, the whole sky. Okay, so uh, actually the, the CTA, CTAO, CTA Observatory was uh, defined last year, June 2021. So there was an agreement by countries, uh, by Germany, Italy, Spain, France, Japan, Poland, and a few more countries. They agreed to finance this so-called alpha configuration, where in the northern side, you will have four LSTs, nine MSTs, and in the southern side, you will have four MSTs and 37 MSTs, okay? So this will be the so-called alpha configuration that will be built now, okay? So uh, a bit more political, these countries are setting up a new organization, this CTAO, and the EU, the, the European, there's a European legal form, it's called an ERIC, and ERIC is just a, it's like a kind of company that works in science. So 
something like that, and it has pan-European level. It's a bit like ESO or a bit like CERN. Okay. This is in the process of being established. It will be established beginning of next year. Okay. And then the construction formally starts. And hopefully everything, the, all the telescopes will be deployed in around five years. Okay. This year, there's been already kind of an upgrade because the, the Italians have got extra money to build two LSTs and a few more SSTs actually. Two LSTs in the south, which is, is, is very important to have LSTs to go to the lower energies, to the lowest energies, uh, is key for, for the lower, for, for less than 100 giga electron bits. Okay, so this goes even beyond the alpha configuration. Okay. Um, so this is a very crowded slide. This is the sensitivity where you see the sensitivity, uh, where you see the energy. And this is one tera electron volt. This is 100 GeV down to around 20 GeV. We will be detecting with CTA in the north where with the four LSTs. So the, the black points is the north, the red points are, are the south, okay. And as you, you can compare here with magic, for instance, the sensitivity of magic, sensitivity of veritas, these are the current the detectors, and also the sensitivity of the particle arrays like Hawk in five years or last in one year. Okay. So you can see that it's, it's a, a very significant increase in sensitivity of almost a factor 10 at, at these energies around one TV. And it goes to the lowest energies around 20 GB or so. Okay. So this will be built. This is the alpha configuration. It will be even better with the LSTs in the south. So also in terms of this is a sensitivity to a very short exposures. So here, this is a one minute observation. And you compare here CTA and Fermilat. Remember, this is a satellite experiment where the collection area is very small. And CTA is beating Fermilat by orders of magnitude. So for short observation, fast transients, it, it will be so much better than satellites. Also in terms of angular resolution, it will be around uh, what you can get with the current telescopes going down to uh, low energies and much better at the highest, uh, the higher energies. Okay, it will be compared to 0.05 degrees, it will be like 0.02 degrees with, with CTA. And what is even more significant is much better angular resolution than LASO. So in LASO, you get detections at the highest energies, but you don't have a very good angular resolution. So it's, it's essential to have CPA to, to, to see where to, you want to go into the details of into the, into the, 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 the shape of the object, object that you are, you are detecting. Okay. So, uh, a few words about the Spanish community that is involved. Um, there's something like 140 scientists and engineers working in all these 12 groups, including, including this institute, IAA, but also many groups from, you can see a big map here, many groups from Barcelona and, and Madrid, IEC in the Canaries, and also the University of Jaén here in Andalusia as well. Uh, is, uh, the Spaniards are involved in the LSTs, so the large telescopes, 23 meters, making key contributions to design and construction. Uh, we are building um, through IAC more than 50% of the, of the project of the LSTs in the north. So uh, a very significant contribution. We are uh, very active in analysis software and scientific exploitation. Here I have to highlight IAA. We are also involved in the MSTs, uh, where they are significant. We're, we haven't really contributed to design, but we'll be paying for, for the installation in La Palma, of MSTs in La Palma as well. And then the construction of infrastructure. One of the data centers, there will be four of them distributed, uh, distributed all over Europe. One of them will be in Barcelona, I think. Then atmospheric monitoring, control software, data analysis software, where also IAA is, is involved. Okay. Uh, and, and if you are interested to access the data, 
there are a few interesting facts here. Uh, CTAO is defined as an observatory open to the astronomical community, but the lion's share of the time belongs to contributing countries. Okay, so uh, an Indian astronomer uh, have access to only a, a small fraction of the time. Most of the time will belong to the countries that are uh, developing and building hardware for, for CTA. Uh, in fact, uh, this will be monitored. I mean, each country will get essentially time proportional to the investment. Spain gets uh, around 15% uh, of the time due to its contributions uh, to the investment in the, in the telescopes and an extra 10% in the north because we are host. So this is the kind of access that we will get uh, in Spanish institutions. In addition, there will be guaranteed time, which is a significant amount. It's, it's like 40% of the time for 10 years, for the first 10 years, where only institutions that have contributed uh, hardware to the to CTA will be able to access, okay? These are the, this, this is the so-called CTA consortium, okay? The, a consortium of scientists that have been involved in the construction and we get this guaranteed time. So all these institutions I mentioned before are part of this consortium and they will have access to this guaranteed time. Okay. Okay, so I want to now uh, spend a few minutes on the science that we are planning to do with these with with these uh, telescopes. Um, so there's a, actually a very wide science case starting from uh, cosmic particle accelerators. So what I show here is, is actually a bit small, but this is if this is our galaxy with the current instruments, we can only see uh, cosmic. Uh, Ray accelerators like supernova remnants, supernova with nebula, in a small part of the galaxy. We CTA, we expect to see the whole galaxy. So we should be able to, to see any uh, accelerator in the galaxy, especially accelerators that go to the need to, to go to beta electron bolts. Much wider range and in distances. We are actually in, interested, we, 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 we plan to make a real census of the particle accelerators in the universe, and I mean different scales from uh, the Cygnus region, for instance, uh, at the level of subgalactic particle acceleration, regions of, of galaxies to, to the, the whole galaxy of Andromeda, for instance, to a starburst like M82, uh, Eulerps, I mean, uh, even stronger starbursting galaxies like R220, right? So to try to cover uh, the whole range of of uh, sizes of the accelerators, to, going from subgalactic to, to very active galaxies. Okay, so we are, we see a lot of jetted sources, so uh, uh, galaxies with a jet or GRBs. So we, are, we would like to look for signatures, hadronic accelerator acceleration in the jet. So AGNs, GRBs, uh, are they accelerating hadrons? So could they be the sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays? We'd like to answer that question. Are AGNs or GRB the sources of stragalactic neutrinos? Okay, I'll come back to this. Especially GRBs, we are especially interested. Uh, we'll come back to this. Um, it's also important to realize that at these energies, gamma rays suffer interesting effects. As they, as they reach us from, from the distant, from distant objects. Uh, here is a, a, an AGN jet. The gamma rays are produced here. When, before they reach us, they may uh, suffer from effects of quantum gravity They modify the propagation. The speed of light may change okay, for these particles. So we are doing this kind of, we plan to do this kind of studies for, uh, with AGNs with gamma rays from AGNs. And gamma rays may trace annihilating dark matter, right? Because in, in, in some models of weakly interacting dark matter particles, uh, they may, um, two dark matter particles may interact and produce uh, secondary particles 
gamma rays at this energy range because that's the range where the mass of these WIMPs uh, is expected to be. So we are looking for this characteristic spectral signature in the uh, in the targets that may come from that matter. Okay. So um, yeah, this is a this is what we actually uh, wrote down in a book that was published already in 2019. Okay, we try to cover the whole science that we expect to do with uh, with CTA. Um, there's an actually a concept here of the key science projects where we try to tackle all these basic questions with a, a number of long term projects. So we are planning to make long term projects extending many years, uh, including, for instance, a survey of the galactic center. So to focus our telescopes on the galactic center and to make a survey of that area around a few degrees around the galactic center to make a, a sorry, this is the uh, then a galactic plane survey. So not only the galactic center, but along the galactic plane, uh, a survey of the large Magellanic cloud, even an extragalactic survey. So for the first time, we will try to go and uh, to go for an unbiased uh, survey of the outside the galaxy, the galactic plane. Uh, we are also, uh, we have a plan to observe transients. We will try to detect cosmic ray p patterns, so uh, sources that go all the way to the beta electron ball. Uh, as I talk about the star forming systems, where you have cosmic acceleration, there's a there's a key sense project about active galactic nuclei and about galaxy clusters. So each of these uh, key sense project has been carefully planned to optimize the 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 science the scientific output we can get with with CTA. Okay. My belief is that we need to update the book because in the meantime we are actually still uh, finding a few amazing things with the current generation of telescopes, and that's what I would like to show in the next slides to show you that the field is evolving even beyond what was uh, planned initially for CTA. Okay, so we got all these exciting news coming from multi-messenger uh, observations, specifically for neutrino and gamma resources. Already back in 2013, uh, IceCube reported the first evidence for high-energy extraterrestrial neutrinos. So now we know that there are neutrinos that come from outside the Earth, they come from the universe. Okay, they could detect them beyond the atmospheric background. So we know that there are neutrinos coming from out there. Uh, back in 2018, uh, a common observation of magic and ice cube reported for the first time an AGN that emits neutrinos. So there was gamma ray, uh, gamma ray detection with magic, very high energy gamma rays, consistent with the direction of a, of a neutrino, just one neutrino, but it was significant enough, okay, the, the correlation. Okay, this was 2018. Now, the, the other day, I mean, it was very, very new in, in, in science the other day, IceCube reported uh, significant detection from another AGN, a very different one, NGC 1068. Um, and actually, you attended the last meeting of the Spanish Astronomical Society. Uh, uh, IceCube was already insinuating that they have three more AGNs that are emitting neutrinos. So this is getting serious. There are really sources, specific sources of neutrinos out there that we plan to observe together with IceCube with CTA. Okay. Even maybe even more interesting. Uh, again, 2018, this uh, Blazer TX0506 that was reported to emit in 2017, one neutrino correlated with magic. Uh, in an archival search, they detected even more neutrinos back in 2015. Okay, so the, this uh, Blazer Texas, whatever, is, is really emitting neutrinos systematically every now and then. And at this time, there was no significant gamma ray emission. So there are times where this uh, AGN is emitting neutrinos together with gammas, and sometimes it's not. So apparently, there's kind of some dark acceleration. You want to call it like that, where, where there are no gamma rays and but there are neutrinos. Okay. 
So, um, and this was a much larger player, okay? many more neutrinos. So these kind of objects will, we need to study with CTA, we need to cover uh, these kind of AGMs systematically. Okay. There, there are new types of, actually completely new types of sources, um, like TEV halos, where you have, this is the moon. Okay. So we are talking here about a huge object in the sky. These are observations by the Hawk collaboration. Um, near Geminga, you all know Geminga, there's a huge halo of particles, a very extended halo of, of, of gamma rays coming from particles around Geminga. Okay. Uh, and these uh, we are interpreting here, uh, like the, the pulsar is producing particles, there's a wind of particles um, re-accelerated actually in the, in the pulsar wind nebula. Uh, the, the scale here is, 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 this is you are zooming in here and you are zooming out here. And as you can see, this is only 300 arc seconds, but on a much, much larger scale, the, the particles are leaving the pulsar wind nebula and is still emitting gamma rays. This actually, a, this is a situation for very old pulsar wind nebula, more than 100,000 years, where you see that the, the, the particles have already diffused away from the, from the pulsar wind nebula, very far from the pulsar, but they are still emitting this halo of, 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 of gamma ray emission. Okay. So this is some business where Ruben here was very much involved. So this must be these very old uh, pulsars uh, where the, the energy density is actually very small, but uh, you can see them because the total energy is actually large and because they are very close. Okay. But this is telling you that the pulsar is really converting 10% of the rotational energy into particles. Okay, So the pulsars are a very efficient accelerators of electrons and positrons, which could explain this remarkable excess in electrons and positrons reported by Pamela or AMS in the past that some people were attributing to, to, to dark matter, okay? So this may be coming from these kind of objects. Even more interesting, Lasso, I told you before about Lasso, this huge Chinese array, okay? Sensitive at much higher energies. This reporting, and this is a table from this paper in Nature with, uh, with 12, so-called pevatrons, where you have emission up to energies of almost one PV. Okay, this is actually even more than one PV, 10 to the 15 electron volts. Okay, and you with, with very clear detections uh, and rather large fluxes. This is in craft units, one craft, three crafts. So they are these objects that are emitting up to beta electron volts with very high flux. They are normally very extended. Okay, this is one of them. So you can see the spectrum going all the way up to almost one PV. Okay, we don't know what they are. They could be pulsar wind nebula. They could be one of the halos. They could be supernova remnants. Okay, so the emission could be leptonic or hadronic. It's very hard to tell because, as I told you, the angular resolution is bad. Okay, so you was you see it's a blob in the sky. This is one degree, so more than one degree blob in the sky. And inside this blob, you may see a lot of things. You know that there are remnants, supernova remnants, maybe possible with nebula, but you don't know what is what. Okay, so you definitely need here the high spectra uh, an angular resolution of, of CTA to complement these observations with much better angular resolution. Okay, you want to see what is inside these pevatrons. Gamma reverse has also been a new news in the in the last years. Amazing news of the, it, start, it all started with the detection by magic of a GRB. This one, 1901.14. Okay, this is the magic flux. This is the magic flux going down. This is time and this is 200 seconds. So, in the, in the first 200 seconds, this is X ray. So, this was the prompt emission of the gamma reverse going down. And we detected very clear signals from, from this GRB the moment we started to take data simply. It took 50 seconds to get there, and then we started to observe, and we immediately saw a signal. Okay, this was pretty amazing. Um, now we can say that the, the, the GRB is actually emitting not only in 
in radio uh, feasible x-rays, but even uh, higher than 100 GB energies in the afterglow. So this is not the uh, prompt emission, the internal shocks, but this is actually the external shock of the, of the GRD is the afterglow. The afterglow is emitting. Okay. This uh, is actually what you see here is an spectral energy uh, distribution. And this is the magic range. This is uh, Fermilat, and this is X-rays. So the the this GRB is emitting almost as much energy in in X-rays as in this second component. There's a second component at very high energies. Okay, it's amazing. This this is a very strong emitter, even at these very high energies. There's a second component that is emitting here, uh, probably coming through inverse Compton of the photons in the jet with, with electron cells synchro from Compton, okay? And this is totally new, something we didn't know. Okay, was proved by magic. Uh, actually, immediately, <laughs> three more GFVs were reported. It was amazing, after many years looking for GFVs, we suddenly uh, Hess looked into the archive and they found one. Mm -hmm. My, uh, has reported another one in the same year, and then in 2020, another one by magic, and the rest still for more than one. So one could wonder if we are stupid because we have spent like 20 years looking at these guys and we didn't see anyone. But now <laughs> I think we were just pessimistic. So <laughs> we didn't, we were focusing too much on the prompt emissions, so the first seconds. Mm -hmm. And we didn't expect a very bright afterglow, even hours after the GRP. We did look for long enough, actually. Okay. So now for CTA, we can get much larger statistics. We are we're hoping to detect the prompt emission and uh, to detect a short GRB, maybe together with a gravitational wave event. That would be amazing. In our dreams, we, we think, think on this. Even more amazing was what happened uh, a few days ago. Uh, this is a, a, a telegram, a GCN circular by Lasso again. These Chinese people, they, they reported uh, for this very bright uh, GRB, the brightest GRB in X rays so far, 2010 09A, and also the brightest in, in Fermilat uh, at a relatively short distance, 0.15 redshift. Uh, Lasso detected gamma rays up to almost 20 tera electron volts. Okay. So imagine was detecting gamma rays up to one tera electron volt. This is up to more than 10 tera electron volts with a huge significance of it's clear. Thousands of gamma rays, they claim, 5,000 photons. So they probably detected the prompt emission of the GRB. And this is, unfortunately, it was full moon, so we couldn't do anything with Schenkel telescopes. I told you before, it was very unfortunate. Uh, but it's clear now that there are many multi TV gamma ray bursts. Uh, there's a whole population of gamma rays to explore, and we need CTA to cover this range from 20 GB to, to 1 TV. Okay, this is really amazing. Okay, so there's still another type of gamma ray emitter since we published the book about uh, this, this, this energy range, which is NOVAS. You probably all know what NOVAs are. Uh, you get a white dwarf with a main sequence star or a, or a red uh, giant. Um, and this recurrent NOVA is a few key, okay, which is having these eruptions. This was 1933, and this is optical. Every now and then, so every, the, the, in average, every 15 years, we were expecting something like this. This is a red giant uh, and white dwarf, um, and it happened. So in, in 2021, it happened. It happened in August 2021. It went very high in optical, uh, and it was detected by Fermilat in, in, in high energy gamma rays. And thanks to a quick follow-up with Hess and Magic, uh, there was a clear detection very short, shortly afterwards reported by Hess, okay? And this is what you see, this is flux, this is a light curve. So this is flux as a function of time. And this is days, so one day, two days, you can see already the, you see the very high energy going up, the very high energy flux going up. This is LAT, 
So a lot was going up probably before the, the very high energy emission. Okay, and then it was going down. And it was still active even after 30 days. Okay. So pretty amazing. Uh, Magic could see a similar thing. Uh, what you got here is a, is a white dwarf, red giant. So there's a lot of ejected material. Uh, there's a lot of matter around that is a target for, for protons, for particles. Uh, and there's a lot of electron acceleration, probably magnetic fields. So you could think that it could be leptonic, and this is what we've been analyzing. So production of through le leptonic, leptonic emission or hadronic emission. And by comparing the, the, the spectrum that was observed, our conclusion in magic was that this must be hadronic. Okay. So you, what you got here is, is really like a micro supernova, but you really have hadronic acceleration, cosmic ray acceleration in, in, in these kind of expanding shells. That happening very quickly compared to a to a supernova remnant. Okay, very interesting. A new type of object again to justify where we go. We try to go as fast as possible to a CTA. And so let me tell you what is going on right now with CTA. Okay, there's advanced construction going on even before the setting up this Eric that I mentioned before. Uh, there's advanced construction, especially going on in the north. A rocket. Okay. So, you know, this is the site of CTA North, and the plan is to have these 14 MSTs, these four LSTs near, these are these four LSTs near Magic, if you know the place. So, this is actually the same with a photomontage. So, this is the existing Magic telescopes. Now, there's, a, there's already one telescope. One of the LSTs is already there has been there for a few years already, and it's fully functional. So it's like a final CTA telescope is already running. We are building these three uh, more LSTs very quickly, and this one of the MSTs, and then we are going for the A remaining MSTs, okay? This is old, this is from 2018. I like this picture because it shows how big it is. I mean, <laughs> here you see uh, these cars around here, and this huge crane that was used to to bring the mirror support on top of the under, under structure. 23 meter, I remind you. Okay. These are the magic telescopes, uh, but these guys really dwarf in all these all the telescopes here. Okay, so 23 meters, 400 square meters, targeting the lowest energy thresholds, 20 GV. There's a good overlap with satellites, but with 20, 10 to the four more collection area. <laughs> This was the inauguration back in 2018. Politicians coming, the minister coming, and all that. In the meantime, we've been trying to, to, to get this telescope to run. We had an eventful commissioning of the telescope with a global pandemia, with a volcanic eruption, and now there's a war going on and so on. But it's going well, so we are almost done. And we're already taking science there. Okay. So let me show you quickly. This is, for instance, uh, very quickly, we could detect the Crab Nebula. Of course, it's very bright. In a matter of 30 minutes, we were, we're getting already 20 signals. Okay, so very clear detections. But we, we've already taken uh, tens of hours of data, and we are about to submit a paper. We could measure very clearly, the, very nicely, the spectrum. OK, so this is uh, LSD1, these blue points here, very consistent with previous measurements with MAGIC. And also with Fermilat, I can tell you, okay, going down to very low energies. Okay, this is 30 GV or so. Okay. 25 GV. This is a paper that is almost submitted. I don't know, it should be submitted. You got it. <laughs> it's almost there. It's going through the referee or something like that. I don't know. Uh, actually, together with the crab nebula, you get the crab also. And again, I mean, it took magic like 10 years to detect a pulsar in these energies, and now we detect it in, in a few hours, okay? Actually, only four pulsars have been never detected, so we are confident we can detect more of them now. And this is the, 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 the phasogram of, of the crab, where you see these nicely, these two peaks with the right ratio of P1 to P2, very high significance and an energy threshold that is uh, around 50 GB. Okay, so this phasogram will be published together with the other paper, but there will be more results coming later on. 
Uh, this is another example, Aris of Yuki. We also look at it with LST and we also detected it very clearly. Okay. And here you can see that the, the, the spectrum with LST1, okay, the spectrum with Fermi, so there's a nice match. And you can see that the spectral point here is, is very close to Fermi, that, so that we are going to very low energy here with the spectrum. There's almost no gap now between satellite observations and, and very high energy observations. This paper, uh, also Ruben and, and, and Map should be working on this. Okay, so this will be out soon. We are also observing AGMs. So uh, and we happen to detect a flare of 2020, in 2021 of BLAC. Okay, not any BLAC, BLAC. Uh, with LST1, that we sent our first ATO with, with CTA. Okay. We were very happy at the time, but there was actually a very strong emission shortly afterwards in, in August, okay, last year. So with a high state, more than one crab. Okay. And actually this guy has a very soft spectrum, so you can go to very, very low energies. Even in less than two, two hours, you can you can get the spectral points at, at 30 giga electrons, which is amazing. Okay. Uh, again, working on the paper, again, people here are involved in this paper. Um, so more AGMs, we are looking at many more AGMs. And we are building the, ne the next telescopes at the same time. So we expect to, this is already there, but these three we are building right now, these other three LSTs. Actually, uh, all the production is finished. So the parts for the telescopes, so the mechanical parts, and even the cameras are essentially finished. The civil works start today, <laughs> I can tell you. Right now, there's a meeting with the architect to, to to, to clarify the last points and to get started with the, with the civil works, digging the ground, making the foundations, and then the, everything is ready. I mean, you can see everything is, is, is ready for deploying. So civil works will come, then next year the mechanics will come, and next year the, the cameras will come. Okay, so you should expect the telescopes in 2025. Okay. So here, here I am, and these are my conclusions. Uh, I believe this field remains a lively field. There's a constant flow of new discoveries and, and, and it's really observationally driven. So they, you got new things that even nobody expected. Yeah. So, so we need urgently <laughs> this new generation of telescopes to, to continue with this constant flow of discoveries. Uh, there's a careful scientific planning based on these key science projects, but it's at the same time, CTAO will be open to the whole community, to all of you, okay? Especially in Spain, you will have access to a lot of time. Uh, this CTAO Eric is under constitution and will start construction, hopefully full construction in 2023 of the remaining telescopes in the North and in the South. But there's already advanced construction. So the first LST is finished and is taking data. And there are three more LSTs expected in 2025. Okay, so thanks everyone. Thank you very much Juan, for this uh, talk. So uh, now the talk is open for questions. I think uh, someone in the room in the Salon de Actos can manage their, their questions. Yeah, I'll take care of the questions here. Okay. So okay. Go on, please. Yeah, so are there any questions? Okay. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of times, I, I'm not sure I understand well, what is the link between the size of the telescope and the energy range that you are sensitive to? Are these two linked together? Mm -hmm. I was too fast. So you okay. can, it was impossible you could understand. <laughs> so but, so the, the, the amount of light that, that, um, that the gamma reproduces is, is proportional to the energy, okay? So the more energy, the more light. Now you need very small telescopes to detect very high energy gamma rays. Instead, you have to go to these huge telescopes to go down to 20 GV energies. So you need a few of these guys to cover the 20 GV to one TV range. Then you need a bit more, a few more of MSTs, 10 meter to go and cover from 100 GV to, and then you, you, you have many of the small ones 
at the highest energies where you can afford to have a small emitter. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks. More questions? Uh, how I always wondered how, I mean, you were talking about the share of the observing time that every building country is going to have, and that Spain uh, will have something like 15% plus an additional 10% because it is a host country. So, how is that additional 10% going, going to be managed? Uh, is it going to be through proposals or through these science projects or something like that? So is, is there an idea or a discussion about that? Right. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so uh, there are two different things. One is the uh, key science projects, and another one is the open time. So open time will go through proposals. Okay, and the idea is that every country will get the the, the right share of of the proposals. Okay, this will be managed by one single time allocation committee. Okay, now how to bring that into the key sense projects is not totally set up okay so this time will in principle be simply put apart and there will be no consideration for this 10 percent fixed amount it's 10 percent in the north by the way only yeah. but we have a right to swap it with time in the south mm -hmm. but then we get less because there are more telescopes in the south so we have to pay more so we get only five percent but it still is a significant amount when you consider that we have spent, uh, we, we will spend like 50 million euros to get this 15% of the time. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. More questions? I, I have a question uh, regarding the neutrino uh, connection in the area that you mentioned. Uh, there were two left. Did that be biased? The two plus were detected, or only the last one? Well, I didn't understand mm -hmm. the problem. Okay. Almost there, here. Okay, so this was, uh, there was one neutrino camera, and then this, this triggered magic and triggered the other telescopes, okay? And we detected gamma rays. Okay, this was the, the flare that uh, that was uh, initially reported everywhere and was published. Okay, but the first flare. And then the Ice Cube looked back into their data, and they found that there was a significant. There was a, a lot of neutrinos. Also, I mean, here there was one neutrino. So here there were maybe ten neutrinos or something like that. A long 2015 actually was almost a long period of almost one. One year. So, so the, the difference between the second and the first is that there, there were not, you know, but they were not assigned to that. Yeah. yeah, because here, I mean, the, here this, because there was an association with gamma rays, this made this blazer, Texas, whatever. Uh, this convinced everyone that this is a neutrino emitter, right? So once you think, once you, you are sure that this is, this guy is a neutrino source. You can go back into your data, but now you only look for this specific uh, AGN, okay? So you deal with it especially, and this is more significant than, than if you look for all the AGNs in the sky. I mean, you look for all the AGNs in the sky, every now and then an AGN by coincidence will have some neutrino and so on, okay? You cannot trust this as much as, as after detecting it together with gamma rays, okay? okay? So now this is a special blazer, we know that is emitting neutrinos. We trust this kind of detection is much better. Okay. Instead, for this one, for instance, 10, 1068, you don't have any prior. So you look at the whole sky and you look for the guys that are really significant. It's not that they look for this guy especially. They look at the whole sky, all AGNs in the sky. So, okay. well, so the important point is that during the First flare that you are talking about, there were no gamma rays. So only oh, this, this, this guy, yeah. The, the, this. But yeah, this is even more interesting. The, the, this guy, we know that it emits neutrino sometimes. We know significantly that it emits something. But here, you got a significant emission of neutrinos, sorry, neutrinos and gammas at the same time sometimes. 
But here there are many neutrinos and no gammas. They're coming from the same position. Coming, coming from the same position in the sky. Yes. Yeah, it's well, from the same position in the sky, uh, according to the ice cube, this, uh, angular resolution. Angular resolution. That it could be another source in the cube. It could be another AGM that just happens to be <laughs> or <laughs> damn it. it but yes. yes. But after all, there are not so many neutrino candidate uh, sources, right? Mm -hmm. This is for sigma, okay? So I agree to your skepticism sometimes. No, I'm <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, are there more questions? Is there, are there like science case that involve both sides, like the north and the south side, or they are completely, they will be independent? Okay, so uh, many of these key science projects involve the, the two sides. Because there are surveys or? They, because there are surveys, there's a stragalactic survey, for instance, we try to be unbiased, okay? Uh, and sometimes you get a transient that you want to follow. And, and sometimes you can observe the same one, the same source from, from both hemispheres, okay? There's quite an overlap, actually. So you want to follow a GRB of the globe, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, more questions? I have just a, a quick one. So you were you were actually showing some results uh, from uh, very recently from LASSO, right? And in the south, so LASSO is in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, there may be another particle detector as, uh, as LASSO that will also cover the highest energies. And actually in the sensitivity curves that you were showing, mm -hmm. that there is the, already the lasso sensitivity curve, the, the one from the south that is called Suigo. So do you think that there is really going to be? Yeah, this yeah, guy here, Suigo. And last yeah. over there, there is going to be a lot of science that the CPA is going to be able to do above 10 tera electron volts. So you are promoting your experiment, Suigo. <laughs> <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Suigo will be very interesting experiment. Do uh, you believe this sensitivity curve is not built yet? Uh, no, it's not even fully designed yet. Even, even lasso. Lasso, so, yeah, yeah. So lasso five years or more. yeah. I mean, CTA is the opposite. CTA will not be built until a few years from now. This is mainly SSTs in the south. Okay. And LASSO is already taking data. They're already taking one year. So they will have an even better sensitivity for the whole sky. Okay. So there will be, I mean, for, for discoveries, LASSO will be taking a lot of science from CTA. But remember that the angular resolution, as I said uh, here, is fantastic. I mean, this, this is 0 0.05, 0 0.02 degrees. Okay compared to the angular resolution of LASSO, which is here, okay? Which is compared to CTA, is lousy, okay? So this is the same that I was uh, trying to show when I was showing the... Okay. These kind of objects that are huge, these pevatrons, they know that there's something there. But the angular resolution is so bad that there are many things that are inside this box. Okay, inside this spot here, there may be a huge supernova remnant, one degree or so, but then also maybe a small supernova remnant that, that you don't know anything about. And, and you need a very good angular resolution to decouple all the possible sources. Okay, and for that, you need CTA. So you need an angular resolution that is as good as 0.02 degrees. Okay, so this competition. But there's also quite some complementarity too. Okay. Thanks. Also for transients, I guess, no? I mean, CDA will be much more sensitive on a small uh, landscape. I mean, the, the cubes that we were shown now were for one year integration for LASU, whereas uh, one year integration on a source from CTA, which is not going to happen. But, you know, exactly. I mean, or you, you will be able to make very detailed light curves. At the same time, I have to be fair to LASSO. You saw this gamma reverse from LASSO, right? So because they have a duty cycle 
they can catch the prompt emission. They are always looking. If it happens to be in their huge field of view, they will see everything. Okay. So they are complementary, really. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so in the room, there are no other questions. Rene, I don't know if there are any questions. Okay, on Zoom, I do not see anyone asking for a question. So if any participant on the Zoom meeting, on the room, you can raise your hand and ask the questions. Otherwise, we can end the talk. Okay. Seeing none questions, I think we can thank again, Juan, uh, Dr. Cortina, thank you again for this wonderful talk. And uh, see you uh, only in next week with another seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.